Well, we have, uh, as Freya said, last week I started a new series, Presence and Power, and uh, we're going to spend the next few weeks unpacking that. And um, last week was very much an introductory uh, message where we looked at the subject of God's presence. We, we look to understand the difference between the omnipresence of God, that is the reality and the truth that he is in everywhere in all things, that you cannot run closer to him or further away, just like the air that you breathe, he is there. And yet we spent time looking at the manifest presence of God, when God reveals himself to us and we become aware of him, and that the presence of God, the manifest presence of God is transformational. And uh, we unpacked all of that last week. And I rooted it in the truth that his manifest presence is his desire to make himself known to us out of his great love for us. You see, we we can often uh, fall into the danger of somehow separating the truth that his manifest presence is born out of relationship, his love for us and our desire for him. I gave you my Avengers superhero impression on the stage. I said his presence and power isn't like we summon his power because we need it in that moment. I talked about a lifestyle, I talked about his presence comes out of that relationship between us and our loving Heavenly Father. Now, if you missed any of that talk, then you can, of course, catch up on our YouTube channel. And it was Pentecost Sunday last week. It was good timing. And uh, we looked at the truth that his Holy Spirit is indwelling in us, but there are moments where his Holy Spirit comes upon us in power. And over the next few weeks, we will look at that in more detail. So this week, I'm going to unpack for us an introductory talk on his power Um, And as I did last week, I first want to establish the source of this power uh, in relation to relationship with God, the purpose of this power, and the why of his power. The the purpose of his power and the why of his power. There are a lot of Ps in there, right there, just, wow. And uh, I I want to do this by reading through uh, Ephesians. Chapter one, and um, I've spent some days, I have to say, bathing in, soaking in, swimming in, meditating in Ephesians one, and it's just so rich, so brilliant in its walkthrough of the power in us. And uh, I was wondering which verses I should take to preach on, and uh, I came to the conclusion that we should, I should preach on the whole chapter. So welcome to uh, the Bible Study Sunday. We are gonna go through the whole of chapter one together. Please lock the doors, don't let them out until we've done so. Just kidding. Um, And we're going to do that. Now the first thing to note, uh, just to understand Ephesians, is that the theme we see throughout the book of Ephesians is the truth that we are in Christ. You will see this phrase used multiple times by the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, that we are in Christ, in him, in Jesus Christ. And um, I was reminded of a book that I read a long time ago, some of you will know this, by Watchman Nee. And he wrote a very famous book called um, Sit, Walk, Stand. And that's really uh, a commentary on, on the Ephesians because what you'll see if you read Ephesians, can I encourage you, you know, This week, read Ephesians. It's only six chapters. You can do it on one sitting. But it talks about the reality that we are in Christ, seated in heavenly places. Therefore, we should walk in that which is given us so that we can stand in the face of the enemy. And you'll know that chapter six is a very famous chapter as it relates to the armor of God. And so the theme really is around being in Christ. You see, it is through Christ Jesus we can attain all things which the Father wishes to lavish upon us. And what we see, and we're gonna see this in a moment, his power in us is rooted in the fact that we are in Christ. The power that we have in us is rooted in the truth that we are in Christ. You know, his power isn't just a set of words that uh, some incantation that we call upon to get some power. 
it, I, I, I'm sorry to say, I can't give you a simple five-step model for this one. Uh, who remembers the story of the seven, seven sons, it's gonna be one of those morning, seven sons of Sceva, three S's right there. Seven sons of Sceva, you read them in, the, in Acts, and uh, they find, found out what, what happens if you try and detach relationship from his power, because they thought, well, hold on, these apostles are casting out demons in the name of Jesus, so we're gonna give it a go. And so what do they do? They, they invoke the name of Jesus Christ and they say, come out of the name of Jesus. And then what do the demons say? They say, Jesus, we know. Paul, we know about, but who on earth are you? And they jump them. I remember a, a talk I did last year and the question was, does, heaven, does hell know your name? You see, these seven sons of Sceva wanted to invoke the power, but they weren't in Christ. Um, I was reminded as I was putting this together of Matthew 7. I wanna read it, 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That is sobering, isn't it? You invoked my name, you wanted the power, but where was the relationship? You know the clue is in this. They said, Lord, Lord. And they says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Can I just tell you, when we read Lord Jesus Christ, Lord is not his name, that's his title. Jesus is his name, and Christ means Messiah, that's his role. And they're saying, didn't we say Lord, Lord? He said, yeah, but you never knew my name. You didn't know me. And the reason I wanna spend this week, it's so tempting for me to jump to the miracles. Trust me, I would love nothing more to, to see, an out, but I just felt impressed upon my heart that God wanted me to spend time this week saying, listen, when we talk about the power of God, it has to be rooted in the reality of relationship because we are in Christ. And that's why we're going to walk through Ephesians. Therein lies my introduction. Let's turn together to Ephesians. It'll be on the screen in the room online. Uh, It'll be on your device. And I'm gonna read this and then I'm going to stop at certain points and we're going to unpack it together. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. To the saints which are in St. Albans and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and Peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Right, let me pause. Let's look at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Listen, the desire of God is that in his presence we would experience the fullness of the spiritual blessings which Christ has won for us on the cross and is our inheritance as adopted sons and daughters of our Father in Christ. Christ is the only begotten Son, but you know the truth that we are adopted in his family, right? That is the good news. And let me point out at this stage the phrase spiritual blessing. You see, we often focus our conversations when we talk about blessing on material blessings, don't we? If you're anything like me, you will. <laughs> we look at the, our world and we say, Lord, would you bless me in that? And by the way, he wishes to bless us. It is the heart of God. You know, every good thing comes from heaven above. But what Paul is emphasizing here 
He doesn't jump to, to material blessings. He says spiritual blessings. Those blessings that are not rooted in this world, but in the spiritual world which we inhabit. Are you following me? You see, it says here that we are seated with Christ. We're going to read that in, the, in a moment. Because we are born of the Spirit of God and are by nature, therefore, citizens of heavenly places. Did you know that? And in heavenly places doesn't mean heaven, by the way. Although that is the destination before there is a new heaven and a new earth. And by the way, in the eternal state, after the millennial reign, and, and then there's going to be a new heaven and earth, we will be on a new earth where God will presence himself with us there. So heaven isn't our final destination. I just want you to know that. And what it means is not heaven as in that destination. It means the spiritual realm that we are seated in with Christ Jesus. In Christ, we have access, therefore, to these spiritual blessings. What are these spiritual blessings? Redemption by his blood, forgiveness, assurance of faith, the fact that we are adopted into his family, peace that surpasses all understanding, joy in all circumstances. These are the spiritual blessings. And yet most of the time when we seek God for blessings, do we recognize the spiritual blessings that we have because we are seated with Christ Jesus? That is the challenge. Um, I have an important envelope here for you that I'd like to open. In here, I have fresh banknotes, and they have 50 on them. They have a number of them. Who would like a 50 banknote? Put your hand up. This is not a trick. Anybody? Yep. Okay, cool. Let's get these out. You, uh, if, you, if you didn't put your hand up, you missed out. Keep your hands up if you want a 50 pound note. Here they are. <laughs> Still want them now? Your eyesight's not very good. These are Monopoly money. Some of you are like, I love Monopoly. I could do with some more 50 notes. Actually, I lost some. All of a sudden, you're like, well, well I don't want them now. Why? Because there's no value. But hey, they're printed on the same kind of paper as those 50 banknotes, aren't they? I mean, these say 50 on it. I could just throw them in the air. Here we go. I'm not clearing them up before the next service. It's the same. Why do we want them? Because we know they're useless to us. Where am I going with this? We're focusing on the wrong things, the wrong things of value. We're focused on this world and the material possessions and what we can acquire, but you can't take it with you. Who remembers that long rope a couple of weeks ago? I said, this is that long rope, that's eternity, and we're living on the little bit at the end, you know, that colored bit, and all we do is we reach in that part. We reach for the 50 pound banknotes. But Paul is saying, listen, wake up, you blessed saints in St. Albans. You have every spiritual blessing available to you because you're seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. I mean, we should leave this place singing hallelujah for the next 24 hours nonstop. But we walk out of here and the reality of the spiritual blessings seem to fade. Why? Because we can't see it so much. It it's, it's becomes it's hard to hold it, isn't it? But that doesn't mean it's not real. I was thinking, you know, imagine if we had a, a map, a treasure chest, and it said there is one billion, one billion, which movie was that? One billion dollars, no, anyway. Um, one billion in a chest that's buried somewhere, and it says, right, here, here, there's a bit, I can't see it. Well, it doesn't mean that it's not there. Just because you can't see that spiritual places that you're in doesn't mean it's not there and that you're not there, seated in that with Christ. Are you following me? Should we move on? Because we've got a whole chapter to get through. And that's not even the point. I'm, I want to get to the power bit. You've got to love soaking in Scripture. Like, I really want to encourage you. Just take chapter one this week and just read it through and then just keep reading it and reading it. Right, let's carry on. Where were we up to? Verse four. Let's go from four to ten. Um, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ 
according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, those he foreknew he predestined. In him we have a redemption. There's one of the spiritual blessings through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. That's a spiritual blessing right there. According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. That is a spiritual blessing that we would understand according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Wow. In him, do you see that theme? In him, in him, in Christ. Everything is available to us, not by our works, lest any man should boast, but by the grace that he has lavished upon us. And it says the redemption we have received through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. This is good news. This is a spiritual blessing that we have. Why? Because of his great immeasurable grace towards us. It's according to his great purpose, which and again is in Christ in order to unite all things in Christ. You know, the redemptive story that we find ourselves one is one of restoring his presence with us, in relationship with us, and in so doing, uniting under Christ all things which were separated. We are united with Christ, in Christ, with God the Father. I'm gonna carry on, we can get to the power bit. Let's carry on reading, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, Spiritual blessing, you have an inheritance coming at you. Did you know that? That's not good English, at you. For you, that's better. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works, works all things according to the counsel of his will, not according to how good you are, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, do you see that again? In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's what we looked at last week, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Spirit of God in us, which causes us to cry, Abba, Father, we are sealed, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. In other words, we've got a down payment until we acquire possession of our inheritance. And listen, that inheritance is gonna be more glorious than you can ever imagine as we rule and reign with Christ Jesus. Paul said, I count all of these hardships as nothing compared with the glory that is to be revealed to the praise of his glory. Let's carry on. Now, Paul shifts gears at this point in chapter one. He says this, for this reason, verse 15, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and for your love toward all the saints, let's carry on verse 16, I do not cease to, cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, Paul having outlined to us the good news of our salvation and the reality that through uh, the redemption by his blood of Jesus and our position in Christ, the good news that we're seated in Christ in heavenly places, the good news that every spiritual blessing is available to us, he then says, and now I want to pray for you. Paul isn't content with just sharing the good news. What he wants to do here, and I love his pastor's heart, is pray for them that they walk in the good news. You know, we can hear this, but there's this moment like, right, Lord, I pray that I would know this and walk in this. Like, when we hear these truths, let's turn it into prayers. Lord, I want this for my life. How often are our prayers for ourselves and others focused on us walking in the truth of the reality of being in Christ? I was, as I was studying this, I was convicted. I'm like, when was the last time I reflected on that truth? that I am in Christ and seated in heavenly places and all his spiritual blessings are available to me. Like, when was the last time I even thought about that, let alone prayed about that? 
You know, we often pray about our symptoms, don't we? Whether that be fear, whether that be sin, whatever that might be, we pray for the symptoms. But here, Paul is saying, listen, I'm not gonna pray for the symptoms. I wanna pray about the root issue. You know, if you go to a doctor and you say, listen, I've got these real headaches or I've got... He, any good doctor, he or she, will try and get to the underlying cause, right? And I think for many of us, the issues that we face, the difficulties we struggle with, the, the inability to overcome sin, the inability to walk in power lies in the truth that and the reality that we are not realizing that we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ. And Paul is saying, listen, I'm gonna spend time praying for you that that would become a reality. And let us, therefore, at that point, why don't we read that? Verse 17. And that, here we go. God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, now listen, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Knowledge and revelation of him. Listen, so many people know about him. Maybe you're here this morning, you know about God. In fact, you might have studied about God, but in the song of Shania Twain, that don't impress me much. Knowledge and study is good, but we're not talking about study and we're talking about relationship. We're talking about an experience of, an understanding of what it means to be in Christ. Because there's a difference between here and here. And Paul is saying, I want you to have a knowledge and a revelation of him. I want you to understand that you're seated with Christ. In other words, I want you to know him. I want you to know his manifest presence with you. Don't just sit on the knowledge of his omnipresence, though we should praise uh, him for that truth. He said, I want you to move from that to an experiential reality of his manifest presence and your awareness that you are in Christ. And maybe this morning you're like, this is the word I've needed to hear. I feel battered and bruised and I feel like I'm trying to get rid of this bad fruit and all of along, I've I've forgotten. For some of you have known this, that I need to operate out of that place of being seated in Christ and seated in heavenly places. I want my heart to be enlightened to his goodness. Anybody give me an amen with that? 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart ever imagined, what God has prepared for those that love him. I want to know him more. I want to experience his goodness now. I don't want to just read it. I want to walk in it. I don't want to just say, oh yeah, that makes sense. I'm seated with, I get the theological position on that. That doctrine makes a lot of sense. I want to move past the knowledge into an experience of that reality. And so I've been so, ch- I've been like, the reason I've been swimming and bathing and soaking and meditating is because I've needed this like a, like a thirsty deer that pants for the water brooks. I'm like, right, okay, this, you mean I can experience the spiritual, I should stop focusing on the other blessings and seek his spiritual blessings because they're available to me. And my worship this week has been, thank you, Lord, for the spiritual blessings. And there's been so much peace and joy that's come from that. We better get motoring. Right, and now we get to the power part. Are you ready? Having established that we are in Christ and therefore we have hope because of the access to every spiritual blessing, because of the inheritance which is ours as adopted sons and daughters, this is what he says in verse 19 and 20. It says this, and... What is the immeasurable greatness, listen, of his? You said that in a very weak way. We'll try again. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his? 
I know you can do better. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his? Well done. Towards us, who? According to the working of his great might. This is not a power that you generate on your own. It's a power that comes from God in his great might that he worked, let's go to 20, that he worked in Christ. Okay, listen, the power that's available to you, this is where he's saying, it's the same power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. What? I mean, if it wasn't in the Bible, you'd think it's blasphemous. Well, that pastor's gone off the rails. He's saying that the power available to us is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So good. Right, here in the first time in this letter, Paul uses the word power. Now, there are three Greek words for power. Iskus, I know I said that wrong, apologies to the Greek speakers, is used nine times in the New Testament. This word represents the power behind physical strength or inner fortitude. The second most word, uh, used word of power is exousia, uh, 103 times in the New Testament. Uh, this word represents the power that comes from delegated authority. But this word power is the Greek word dunamis. It literally means explosive. You see, we get our English word dynamite from this word. So Paul is saying, you've got dynamite available to you. Anyone want some dynamite? Dynamite to blow away the boulders of fear. Yes, please. The dynamite to blow away the rock of oppression. Yes, please. The dynamite to blow away the mountains of opposition. Yes, please. The dynamite away to blow away the decaying buildings of sin in our lives. Yes, please. That's when the church says amen. amen. So just, oh, let's just, it's too much, Mark. It's just too much going on here. Just, just slow down. So you're saying, right, if I'm hearing you correctly, that because we're in Christ, because we have every spiritual blessing available to us, the, the power that brought Jesus, raised him from the dead, seated him in the heavenly places, is available to us? Yes. Now, this is where I've been praying this week. I've getting, so why don't I see it anymore, Lord? Why don't I see that more, Lord? Like, if that is the reality, why am I not seeing it in my life? I, I don't have an answer, by the way. You're looking at me like, okay, great. And what did God say? Well, there are answers, of course, which we'll explore over the next few weeks, but uh, you'll have to come back next one to Sunday, okay? I find this amazing. The, the power he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand in the heavenly places is available to us, and that's... My, my pray, Lord, for all of us, Lord, I, I pray that we would, we would walk in that truth. Lord, quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of not seeing enough power in my life and the lives of, of my friends and family. Lord, if I'm honest, I'm a bit sick and tired of not walking in that. I want to walk in that, Lord. That is my desire. And it says to all those who believe, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my unbelief. I said we'll do it chapter one, so uh, we've got three more verses. Should we do it? Hmm. Let's do a run up with verse 20. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under Christ's feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Why is the power 
the dynamite, the dunamis of God available to us because we are His body. We are in Christ. He is seated in heavenly places. We are seated with Him. Why is that power available to you and to I? Because everything has been put under Jesus Christ's feet. I'm going to try with this side over here. We've been seated with Christ Jesus. All things have been united under Christ. Everything has been put under His feet. And it is available to us. Anybody else sick and tired of not seeing the power? Anybody want to walk in dynamite? Anybody want the dynamite to blow away oppression? Anybody want the dynamite to blow away fear? Anyone want the dynamite to blow away the sin that is in our lives? Anybody want to see miracles? Anybody want to see the sick healed? Anybody want to see the dead raised? That power is available to us. All who believe, I want to believe. Let's stand, church.